uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Miriam Nyhan Gray, and I'm the Associate Director and Director of Graduate Studies for New York University's Centre for the Study of Ireland and the Irish Diaspora, Luxman Ireland House. Uh, we're delighted to see so many on here today with us uh, in the United States, in Ireland and beyond for what promises to be a great event. The programme will run for approximately one hour. Uh, Professor Kenny will lead the interview with our guest speaker and we will try to get to some audience questions. Uh, thank you to those who already sent questions in advance. It was great to see such enthusiasm. And please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to post questions as the conversation um, advances. Um, we will rebroadcast re this event uh, on our YouTube channel and on our public radio hour, This Irish American Life, very soon also. So our guest today um, uh, is a fitting uh, guest to have uh, as we remember that this week we marked um, International Women's Day. Next week, of, of course, is the important, the most important day in the Irish calendar with St. Patrick's Day. Um, I'm speaking, of course, about our former ambassador of Ireland to the United States, Anne Anderson. So I'm going to give a brief uh, bio uh, for Anne today before I hand over to Professor Kenny, who will um, lead the uh, conversation with um, the former ambassador today. So uh, Ambassador Anderson was um, ambassador of Ireland to the United States from August 2013 till July 2017. She was Ireland's 17th ambassador to the United States and the first woman ambassador. She was born in Ireland in Clonmel, County Tipperary and received a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Politics from University College Dublin and a Diploma in Legal Studies from King's Inns Dublin. She entered the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs as it was known then in 1972. Following a range of assignments at home and abroad, she was promoted to the rank of Assistant Secretary General in 1991 with responsibility for corporate services services, including finance and personnel issues. She took up her first posting as ambassador in 1995. Prior to Miss Ambassador's assignment in DC, mm -hmm. she serves, served as Ireland's ambassador to the United Nations in New York, ambassador to France, ambassador to the European Union, Brussels, and ambassador to the United Nations, Geneva. Her Washington assignment, uh, during her Washington assignment rather, her, the ambassador was particularly focused on further strengthening Ireland-US economic trade and investment links, highlighting Ireland's interest in relation to reform of US immigration legislation, supporting US interest and engagement on key issues still to be fully addressed in Northern Ireland, and further deepening the vibrant cultural connections between both countries. She has undertaken a wide range of responsibilities in her various assignments as ambassador. Some highlights of her multilateral work include chairing the WTO Trade Policy Review Body, uh, the UN Commission on Human Rights, and heading the Irish team in Brussels during Ireland's EU mm. presidency in 2004. During her New York assignment, she oversaw a review of the UN peace building machinery and was tasked by the President of the General Assembly with facilitating preparations for the 2013 UN special event on the Millennium Development Goals. As Ambassador to the United Nations, her particular focus was on development, human rights, gender equality issues. From her assignment in Brussels, she retains a key interest in EU affairs. As a former ambassador in Paris, her involvement with France always con also continues. Ambassador Anderson was awarded an honorary doctorate by the National University of Ireland in December 2011 and by Fordham University in 2017. She was listed among Ireland's 25 most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network in 2015 and 30 Irish women you need to know by the Irish Times in 2017. In 20, 2016, 2017, she was honored with a range of awards, including from University College Dublin, Irish America Magazine, the Flax Trust, the Irish International Immigration Center, and the Irish American Partnership. 
she was presented with the International Leadership Award by the Ireland Funds at its 25th National Gala in DC in March 2017 and a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Irish US Chamber of Commerce in 2017. In 2018, the Trinity College Historical Society, um, often referred to as the HIST, presented her with a gold medal for outstanding contribution to public discourse, and she was also the first gold medal recipient from the Politics Society of UCD. At the invitation of the UN Secretary General, Ms. Anderson joined this his advisory group for the Peace Building Fund in 2017-2018. She was appointed chair of the group for 2020-21. She has also joined the advisory boards of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University and our own Luxman Ireland House. She is a member of the board of the Irish-based global company Smurfit Kappa and of the board of Druid Theatre Galway and a collection of her speeches and reflections, Thinking With My Pen, Speeches from a Life of Dis Diplomacy was published uh, recently and gives us the opportunity and excuse uh, to have us with her, us here today. Um, after that so impressive um, biographical um, uh, background and with um, a deep sense of honour and humility in terms of having the opportunity to introduce you and I will now hand over to the Professor of, Lu uh, of the Chair of Luxman Ireland House, Professor Kevin Kenny. Well thank you Miriam um, and uh, welcome Anne. Um, Thinking with my pen, speeches from a life in, in diplomacy. I, I've had a copy of uh, the book in my apartment uh, since it came out um, late last year. And um, I've had the pleasure of slow reading it. In other words, it's a book that I didn't have to uh, rush. It's a book I've dipped into. Uh, I've read the whole thing now, uh, looking for different themes and patterns. Um, and I want to return to that title, uh, Thinking with my pen. Uh, a little later in our conversation today. Uh, but I thought we could begin um, with an image that uh, runs through many of the speeches. November 1972, um, the book begins uh, with a vivid uh, image of you uh, entering the Department of Foreign Affairs fresh from university. Um, I wonder if you, if you could um, recall for us um, today what uh, what, th what that was like, uh, uh, that memorable day uh, in November 1972. Well, um, thanks for having me, Kevin, and uh, thank you, Miriam, for that very generous uh, introduction. Um, yeah, Kevin, it's you used the word vivid, and that day is still so vivid in my recollection. Uh, sometimes it's really difficult to believe that next year I'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of that date. Uh, it's still so fresh in my mind. Uh, it, was, it was such a sense of excitement and such a sense of exhilaration um, at that time. I had, as you said, I was just 20 years old, uh, fresh from UCD. Uh, my three-year degree at UCD was 69 to 72. So we were just catching up with the, the radicalism that was part of the university experience at the time. So it had been a very stimulating, exciting, challenging few years for me at university. And then as I entered uh, towards the end of November, I was within a matter of weeks of our joining the European Union. We joined, as you know, um, and as your, those on the, the call will know, Ireland joined uh, on the 1st of January 1973, and that changed everything so much in our lives, but certainly it was transformative on service. So joining just then on the, on the cusp of our entry to the European Union uh, created a tremendous reason of excitement. And uh, I, I, I recall it so often and, and so vividly, everything about uh, that time. And I hadn't really, you know, I hadn't aspired to be a diplomat my whole life or anything like that. So everything happened rather quickly. So there I was very, uh, very idealistic, very bright eyed, uh, tremendously excited to join the department. So at the same time, um, you entered a, a bureaucratic structure that was uh, 
inexorably masculine, I think, uh, all the more so for not being aware of it. <laughs> and um, ge gender inequality and sexism are a big theme in the book. Um, and w w one thing I picked up on, in fact, you make it explicit, is um, a growing impatience with that uh, in, in the course of your career. At the same time, uh, as you say, this is not a misery memoir. This is an optimistic book uh, where I think uh, at each turn you, you changed um, adversity into opportunity. So I, I wonder how that, that worked um, in terms of gender personally and professionally to the extent that you want to talk about that. And then also, of course, at the broader policy level culminating, say, in marriage equality. Well, I'm very happy to talk about it. Indeed, Kevin, and I think we should talk about it. And I'm, I'm conscious, obviously, we just celebrated International Women's Day a few days ago. Yes, it is a major theme in the book. Um, I've thought about it, lived it, spoken about it a lot. Gender, it was an issue, I think, throughout my career in different ways at different times. Uh, you're right. It, joining the department in 1972. It was overwhelmingly male structure, male conditioned, male oriented. There were few women diplomats. And that's partly, of course, because of the legacy of what was known as the marriage ban, the ban on married women in public service in Ireland from the foundation of the state until just before we joined the European Union. So of course, one lived with the legacy of that. Very few women diplomats, practically no role models. Uh, a very male environment. And there were early in the career, and I chronicle them in the book, instances where I had to stand up and fight. For example, in 1976, when I had my first posting abroad, I was the first married woman in the history of the service to be posted abroad, the first married uh, woman diplomat. So I had to wage a battle for uh, an equal allowance, a married officer's allowance, equal to what married men were getting. So from time to time, there were these specific issues in the early years. Now, of course, things changed uh, considerably over time. And the Department of Foreign Affairs today is unrecognizably different from the department that I joined. But I think what was depressing was that while the issues changed and the department did grow and, and transform, they never really went away or never quite went away and manifested themselves in different and less direct ways. And I, I talk, for example, in the book about um, the issues around the appointment of Secretary General, the top job in the department in 2009, and how I felt that sexism was, a, was an issue at the time. And it's we've never had a woman Secretary General in the, the hundred years of the existence of the department. And then I bring it right up to my last posting. Uh, when I was ambassador in Washington and for St. Patrick's Day 2014. I'm not going to rehearse all the, the details, but there was pretty egregious behavior by a very senior um, Irish civil servant. And the fallout from that was unmistakably sexist. Uh, the way the media carried the stories, the kind of anonymous brief was being given by government sources to the media and the, the language being used about me, which was sexist. So as you say, you try to get that balance because I really want to um, recognize and acknowledge and applaud all the change that there has undoubtedly been uh, over that period. But I, I don't think you do anybody a service if you try to erase or airbrush the difficulties because yes, there has been huge change, um, but you know, the department is still a very pyramidical structure. We're still relying on pipelines to bring women to the top and still trying to work to make sure those pipelines don't leak as they're prone to do. Uh, so so I, I do think it's, it's important to, to be true to the, the history of that time. And as you, you talk about the, and I mentioned it, the rising impatience, I think that's probably a quote from one of my speeches because after I retired and I was back in Ireland and I was often invited to speak you know, to lawyers or medical groups or whatever. And you just become so conscious of the pervasive inequality at the top levels, whether it's in politics with, you know, less than a quarter of members of the Doyle are female, 
whether it's the top echelons of business or the corporate world or the legal profession, the um, academia, there, there are issues everywhere. And, and you know, it, I finish on this. If I, if I had imagined back in 1972 that almost 50 years later, we would still be talking about these issues. You know, when we felt that, that this sexism and so on was going to wither away. Well, it didn't wither away and it's not going to wither away unless we confront it. So I, I have been quite outspoken about it and my, my impatience has been rising. <laughs> uh, uh, as indeed it does in a good way towards the end uh, when, you, when you write, uh, it is simply unimaginable uh, that a female version of uh, Donald Trump uh, would ever have been elected. Uh, fair enough, but then you immediately point out that that doesn't mean the Democrats or America are ready for a female president. And you point out that if Bernie Sanders uh, appeal to some, uh, does anyone seriously believe uh, that a woman candidate projecting grouchy pugilism uh, would stand a chance? Um, I wonder, um, in light of all this, uh, the, the question of gender, but, but other um, career issues in particular, uh, what, what kind of advice would you give today to um, a young university graduate uh, embarking or hoping to embark on a career of public service in, in a time of such corrosive um, skepticism? Well, I, I'm a huge advocate of public service, and I would always say that it is an incredibly worthwhile choice uh, as a career. Um, and it, it's a career of service, really. I mean, that's what it says in the words. That's what <laughs> that's what you get. Uh, and your the worthwhileness comes from the fact that you that's your purpose to do to do some good in the world, whether it's you're serving your community or you're serving your country or on the wider stage, whether you're trying to struggle for a better world. So always this, this worthwhileness, the, the fact that at any stage in your career, hopefully you can look at yourself in the mirror and you can recognize the frustrations and the challenges and all that, but that you can feel in its essence that it was, uh, it is something worthwhile that you're doing. But, but I think you have to, I mean, if I go back to the, the conversation we had a couple of minutes ago about uh, how I felt at the outset of my career. In addition to that sense of embarking on something worthwhile, I think you have to have that sense of excitement about it as well, that sense of exhilaration, that passion. So don't do it just, certainly don't do it because it's the safe option, because it's a permanent pensionable job, because you know, you'd soon grow bored to, to death if that's the motivation. Of course, yes, do it because it's worthwhile, because that will sustain you through the ups and downs um, of you know, the, the inevitable challenges and frustrations of career. But do it in particular, if in addition to feeling it's worthwhile, you feel it's, it's something that is speaking to you in a way that excites and exhilarates you. And of course, you know, the, the be ready for the frustration. Um, not everybody wants to work in a bureaucracy. Some people will get very impatient with the sometimes glacial pace of change. Um, and, you know, alluding to, you know, your comments there about the pervasive misogyny and different perceptions of women. I think young women, you know, they, they, they have to be bold and confident and, and be assertive, um, but never take it for granted, never feel that, oh, those battles are, they're dealt with and that it's only sort of middle-aged women that, <laughs> that, you know, fight those old battles. The, the, the battles are, are, are still to be fought and the time you become complacent is the time you slip backwards. So um, yes, public service, um, I am, as you gather, uh, I'm an advocate and mm -hmm. I would never have wanted uh, to, you know, you're never going to make money, you're never going to do certain things, but but you can that that capacity to look in the mirror and feel look. I tried. I was part of something important. There's nothing that can replace that feeling. Uh, and when you when you look back on your career in the book, um, you identify three uh, defining identity identities and influences, as you put it. Uh, and three, I would be proud to uh, share myself: um, being Irish, uh, being European 
and having a strong affinity with America. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on, on again, to borrow from your, your own terminology, perhaps uh, the European years and the American years uh, in your career. Uh, briefly a, a touch on them, because I think they'll come up in chat uh, once we, we open the conversation up. Uh, firstly, with regard to the, the EU, um, there's, a, there's a very strong um, assertion in the book um, of the EU as a community of values um, and a sense that the EU matters uh, in a multipolar world in the 21st century, the kind of world we're entering into. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about um, how then that will matter, how it will translate into policy, whether it's soft power, human rights, climate change, so many of the critical issues today, the importance of the EU and perhaps the importance of Ireland within that context? Well, to speak first, I suppose, about the importance um, of the European Union and the value that I place on the European Union. I mean, it's, it's, it's very personal to me. Uh, I owe so much of my life and my career to the EU because of the changes that our EU membership brought to Ireland and specifically brought to Irish women. But going, so I am I'm a believer in the European Union, but, but way beyond that personal sense of um, gratitude, if you like, to the European Union is the belief that I have, and indeed you carefully read the book, one of the, the quite early speeches is about values um, in the European Union, um, the values that we espouse, the values um, that we bring to bear in our global interactions. And I don't want to be um, starry-eyed or be wearing rose-colored spectacles about the European Union. I mean, I know there are issues. And, you know, if you look back at the recent years and the EU engaging with the, the challenge of migration across the Mediterranean, didn't cover itself in glory. If you look at some of the, the complications in our dealings with the illiberal democracies that we now have in Hungary and Czech Republic and Poland, yes, there are big challenges for the European Union. So I, I, I don't, I am never suggesting that the EU is, is flawless in its makeup or in its role. But I would assert that the bedrock values of the European Union are very solid values. And, um, you know, the, 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 the freedoms that it espouses, the creation of decency and dignity for individual lives, um, the standards that it brings to bear in its own interactions with member states, and in its actions in the world. Uh, I mean, it is um, probably the greatest practitioner of soft power diplomacy. Um, it is, its development aid policies are a model of their kind. I would say they're better than any uh, comparable policies. So in terms of the, the, the continually evolving development and articulation of the EU values and the EU role in the world, uh, I think there's a great deal to be proud of. And I think it's so, it is so necessary to your point, uh, Kevin, in this complicated multipolar 21st century world. Um, and I think, you know, the EU is obviously reflecting on how to enhance its own footprint in the world. Uh, yes, we have, you know, a more benign American administration now, but everybody is sobered by the experience of the four years of the Trump administration. But beyond that, the world obviously is evolving. Um, the geostrategic realities are changing. China is now not a rising power, but a power. It's flexing its muscles in all sorts of ways. Um, and the EU, together with the US, is really going to have to um, do some and continue very serious thinking and policy evolution about how it, how it deals with China. Um, and I hope that the EU and the US can get on the same page in relation to that. But so to, to try to summarize what is a, obviously a huge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, the fundamental bedrock values of the EU are very solid. And those values are more than ever needed in this shifting geostrategic reality that we're now part of. And then uh, touching briefly on the uh, related issue of uh, the, the UN, which was your, your next uh, period of service, um, one of uh, 
the quotes from your book that struck me as um, multilateralism is is good for uh, small nations, um, if I have that right, um, for small countries. Um, it, to turn that around, I'm assuming that small countries are are good for the world or good for the UN. Uh, what, uh, what what's the role of a, uh, of our country uh, in the UN? We're playing an important role at the moment, but uh, can you talk talk about that? Yeah, well, I agree with you. It goes in both directions. I think multilateralism is certainly good for small countries. It's a way for us to amplify our voice. It gives us a stage we can project our values and have a role on a much larger stage. But the, the small countries are, in many ways, the backbone of the United Nations. Uh, there is a group there, the Forum of Small States, uh, which is, comprises countries under 10 million in population. And they are, I think at last count, over 100 of the 193 or so members uh, of the United Nations. And they play a role at every level uh, in the UN. I mean, people, people generally, can more easily trust a small country. Um, you don't carry the baggage, whether the colonial baggage or some of the contemporary baggage that large countries uh, carry. So if you can inspire that kind of trust, then that means that you are much more likely to be invited into positions of influence as chairing of processes or facilitating processes. Um, and you know, Miriam talked about that in her introduction of what I did, but Many of my colleagues, other Irish ambassadors have done that same kind of solid work. And small countries, they're the source of initiative, a lot of the source of energy. They are the brokers of compromise. Um, they are the, the believers in the United Nations. They are, and they're not just you know, believers in the sense of being cheerleaders. They, they're like we are, very practical supporters in every way for us with our peacekeeping, with our role in elective bodies, with the initiatives that we have been part of. And of course, um, as you mentioned right now, um, in our Security Council role, where speaking of uh, the increasing role of women in the department, I should acknowledge our, our brilliant woman ambassador uh, to the United Nations, uh, Geraldine Bernason. But, but it is, you know, we are, um, I was reading recently that JFK's speech to the Irish Parliament where he talked about the, I think he was quoting Lloyd George about the five foot tall nations and what they contribute to the world. Well, you know, maybe we're a five foot tall nation, but in the UN you can feel six feet tall. And we, we take on a workload there, we small nations, uh, that is very, very sizable. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, a couple of other uh, points I want to raise because I, th I think in, in a few minutes we'll open it up to, to conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll roll the dice and see, and see what happens. Um, but I, I did want to get back to the title, Thinking With My Pen, and uh, perhaps we could, we, we could talk a little bit um, about, about the importance and uh, power of words. Um, a diplomat, you say in the preface, must value words, ideally should love words, and language is a, is, for a diplomat is a sword and a shield. Um, thinking also somewhere behind me on my bookshelves, I have the uh, Oxford Dictionary of Euphemisms, uh, subtitled, uh, How Not to Say What You Mean. Um, so there's, um, there's uh, an art of language here, um, Thinking with my pen, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the, these speeches were written by you. They weren't ghostwritten. Um, they're delivered in your own voice. Uh, they're written with a pen. Uh, they're, they're written in longhand. Uh, um, and language is, is so important right now. Political language has been you know, systematically undermined in, 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 in our period. Um, I wonder if you, if you would reflect just on the importance of language to you as a diplomat and as a stylist. Well, I, I think, as you said, and as I write about, language is absolutely critical. It's, um, it's the primary tool of your trade if you're a diplomat. Um, and you talked about euphemisms and not saying things. Well, often I have felt the best things to say things directly and clearly, but there are times, of course, when that isn't the thing that's best going to serve the outcome. So I think to be a good diplomat, you really do have to have an affinity for words. Uh, 
like in, I suppose, many other professions, when we speak, it's to persuade, sometimes it's to inspire. Uh, you, you, you have to be able to um, articulate uh, concepts and, and, and inspire receptivity towards those concepts. But I think particularly of the written word, Kevin, is where, um, where it's most significantly the, the tool of diplomacy. Because for me, in any negotiation, and negotiation is at the heart of what you do as a diplomat, in any negotiation, negotiation, the key moment is when you turn from concept to language. Um, and there, you're putting language on the table and you're developing language in a way that has to be nuanced, that has to accommodate different positions, that has to be calibrated maybe as positions evolve. Um, and so the person who can, who can wield the words and massage the language um, to reflect realities, um, that is the person who has the most chance of, of, of seeing themselves reflected in the outcome. So um, yes, you can choose styles and sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's the direct style, which is the one where possible I always favor. But sometimes of course, and I, you know, I remember particularly the years in Brussels around the negotiating table, those four years where I barely left the, uh, the conference room, how important it was um, to be able to, to find language that could develop the negotiation that maybe could bring it to an outcome. So time and again, I have found that it, 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 it's that calibration of language to accommodate positions is at the heart of successful diplomacy. And you take pride in, in noting uh, that you have, uh, quote, the instincts of a history graduate. Uh, that, that's uh, music to my ears. And as I listen to you describing the, the power and craft of language, um, it, it rings true. Um, how, how would you say that studying history, or one might say the humanities more generally, uh, would prepare one for, for, for a life in, pu in public service? Was there something about that discipline, even at this remove, that you would recall as useful? Well, I mean, history, of course, is fundamental, because if you don't understand the past, then you're going to repeat the mistakes of the past. So time and again, um, I found myself reflecting on precedent, reading, um, uh, rereading experiences and being able to draw on them and um, filter them so that they became relevant to my contemporary experience. But in a much wider sense, um, Kevin, the, the, the humanities, I mean, everything about everything in diplomacy it's about language, but underlying all that, of course, it's empathy. It's being able to um, relate to other people's experience and uh, to really, not just in a superficial way, but, but to, to absorb that experience um, and reading and listening and understanding and becoming emotionally open to other people's experience. All of that, I think, is shaped of course by your whole life experience but it is it is certainly shaped by an education in the humanities um, and i think developing i wouldn't even call it those skills because it's more it, it's how it shapes your personality and mm -hmm. um, it's not just a transactional thing like a skill but your trans your 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 personality is shaped in a way um, that helps you professionally so i it's, I wouldn't want to say in a very, in an overly concrete way, oh, look, this helped me do that. Mm -hmm. It's more the, the, the kind of human being that you can become by your exposure to study of the humanities mm -hmm. is going to help mm -hmm. you in your profession. Yes, and so it becomes a way of thinking about the world. Um, the, and that leads into my final um, point I wanted to raise before we open things up, which is um, the importance of culture uh, in diplomacy. Uh, and it's perhaps especially in, in your career or in Irish diplomacy, I don't know. Uh, uh, many of us in the audience today know about your cultural work. Um, 
both as ambassador and since your uh, retirement. And of course, we, we know it very well here in Glaxon, Ireland, as, as you're uh, uh, um, an honored member of our board. Uh, the book contains testimonials uh, to se several prominent uh, Irish cultural figures um, that are delightful to read. Uh, is, there, is there one in particular that springs to mind? Uh, <clears throat> it's a hard question to, yeah. uh, with that choice. Um, I'll come to it in a second, Kevin, but I, yeah. I do want to say culture, it's, it's hugely important to Irish diplomacy. Um, so that I wasn't exceptional. I think, and you know Dan Mulhall, our ambassador in Washington now, I think Dan tweets some poetry every day. So it's not just me, um, <clears throat> but it was certainly very important to me. Um, so that has given me a minute to, to think about your question. Um, yeah, they, they were all great, but I, I think what probably uh, really lingers in my mind more than, more than most is that encounter that I described with Brian Freel mm -hmm. uh, in my Paris years when we had a feast of Freel at the Irish College in Paris. And for various reasons, because I love theatre, as Maria mentioned, I'm on the board of Druid. I was so proud that his words were being so admired and translating so well to very demanding French audiences. But it was, I think, the character of the man himself. You know, he was a little bit frail um, uh, at 80. Um, but it was that, what I think of at least, is so quintessentially Irish that uh, he was a modest, almost a shy man, certainly no trace of ego. Um, but so brilliant. And I mean, he was equally at home in the lanes of Donegal as he was in exploring Ibsen or Chekhov or Turgenev. And, and it was just, I, I found myself so happy to be in his company. And I think I described that lunch at the embassy in Paris. And I was about to leave the embassy. My posting was coming to an end. So maybe there was a resonance of that as well. But I just felt so happy to be in the company of, of such a, um, a gentle, lovely person who was also so brilliant. And to me, just summed up the best of what it was to be Irish. Mm. Um, so, yes, but, you know, it, it's a hard thing to choose, but if you force me, I think I would choose that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to put you, uh, put you in a bind. Uh, so we'll, op we'll open things up now. And I'm actually going to start with uh, questions that have been uh, coming in since early this morning uh, before the event opened. <laughs> so I, we had emails and... Uh, Tom McCormick in Dublin uh, asks, uh, without breaching any secrets, uh, what was the most pleasant posting and the most difficult time uh, to be our ambassador? Um, let me, well, I think, I'm not sure if pleasant was the word, is the word because fulfilling maybe is the word I choose. And, and, and you know, I don't want to be just diplomatic and saying they were all great postings, they, they genuinely were. But, but I have to say the last posting as ambassador to the United States, that felt um, extraordinary um, because of the importance of our connection with the United States, because of the size of our diaspora, because of the scope of it, the opportunity for travel, the multifaceted agenda, and because it matters so much what's happening in our relationship with, with the US. So, um, Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if pleasant is the word, but the, the one that, that, that probably really felt the most fulfilling. And again, without breaching secrets, I, 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 I think the time in that posting that was the most difficult was the final six months of the posting. Uh, because, of course, that coincided with the arrival of the Trump administration. And um, I leave aside the fact that as you might imagine, I was out of sympathy personally with uh, um, the policies of the, the president and the new administration. Um, but it was also the need to, to position ourselves so that all of the access um, that we had enjoyed with the Obama Biden administration, um, that we wouldn't lose that. Um, that we would keep channels of communication open and doing that while at the same time calibrating our own positions because of course you wanted to build the relationship but without compromising your values 
So I did find that a very, very challenging final six months to my career. And uh, Dan Dennehy, uh, for New York State AOH Immigration Chair, is interested in your thoughts on immigration reform in general, a huge issue uh, in the United States, and then uh, potential involvement of the Irish American community uh, in, in that uh, issue. Well, uh, Dan and I soldiered together on that issue, uh, uh, of course. Um, I devote a, a chapter in the book to that, and, and I go into a lot of detail, again, with my historian's instinct in one of the speeches, in really laying out step for step um, what we tried to do, what we, Ireland, the government, together with the uh, Irish American community and the organizations, and how at times we were hopeful, and uh, ultimately um, it was tremendously disappointing. Um, that we didn't achieve what we hoped. Um, so my thoughts in general, look, the, the US immigration system is broken, absolutely broken, and it is going to have to be repaired sooner or later. And there have been attempts repeatedly um, to some more ambitious than others, some modest, some very ambitious to try to repair it. Um, and they haven't succeeded in, in recent years and down as, as well as most of Irish America know the, the history of that, the ups and downs and failures. President um, Biden is going to try again. Um, he is very determined. He has clearly signaled it as a priority for the new administration. Um, so we have another opportunity. Uh, we know his, the knife edge um, uh, majority that the Democrats command uh, in the Senate in particular um, and the the race in the next two years to try to achieve something um, perhaps in advance of the midterm elections so um, my optimism is tempered by the persistent failures that we had and um, so it would be um, an imprudent person um, that would go out and say, oh, it's all, you know, now we have President Biden, everything is going to be okay. And I'm also cautious because I know that the hopes of the undocumented in general, but of course, for me, a particular concern was the undocumented Irish. Their hopes were repeatedly raised and dashed again. So I think one has to be very, very careful about psychologically not going through that again. So, um, but, you know, there is an inexorable logic to reform because the system isn't working. So hopefully that, that logic for reform combined with um, the priorities of the Biden administration will lead to an outcome. I certainly hope so. It was the biggest disappointment of my Washington years that we didn't succeed in achieving something. Thank you. Um, comment and uh, question from, <coughs> excuse me, from Ted Smith. Uh, Comment, congratulations, Anne. Uh, we joined the uh, service at, uh, at the same time and with the same excitement over EPC European coordination. Uh, the question, uh, it has been said that the UN needs the US, but the US does not need the UN. Uh, could you please comment? Well, um, thanks for the nice words, Ted. And I remember the, the, those years together very well. Um, that, uh, certainly the US needs the United Nations, um, and um, it was, if I use the word sad, I could certainly use much stronger words, it was uh, so difficult over the four years of the Trump administration, um, watching how the United Nations was uh, undermined um, at almost every turn by the uh, Trump administration. Um, and the, the UN, I talked about the role of um, the, the small nations there, but of course it needs the uh, P5, five members of the Security Council, of course it needs the United States. I think the, the more challenging question is um, about the US need for the United Nations. Um, and I think any American people or policymakers who would discount the importance of the United Nations um, would do so at their peril. 
Um, firstly, if I, I want to, and I, I won't spend too long on it, Kevin, I know you have other questions, because each of these questions oh. <laughs> deserve an essay in response. But the, on the, if you like, the, um, the, the, the negative side of it, you know how they say nature abhors a vacuum? Well, so does international politics abhor a vacuum. And when the United States withdrew, at least to some extent, and psychologically from the United Nations, what did we see happen? We definitely saw a growth in the influence of China, for example, at the United Nations, taking on more roles uh, um, and taking on more positions at senior levels in the hierarchy. So if the US doesn't tend to the UN, well then others will tend the garden and the US might not like the result. But in a more positive agenda, I mean, there's no question, but the big challenges of the 21st century, whether it's climate change or terrorism or the international global order or development aid, none of those 21st century challenges are going to be solved by any one country alone, no matter how big or how consequential that country is. So um, if the US is going to be a serious player on those issues, it needs to play on the multilateral field and the United Nations. And, and then a direct follow up from that uh, that uh, just popped up in chat from Molly MacDonald. Uh, what, what would um, what would you say Ireland's role in, in precisely that would be on the global stage? Um, um, what, what do you hope the role of Ireland may play on the global stage in contemporary politics? What do you think that narrative will sound like? Does Ireland have a role? So we're talking about the US, we're talking about the UN, but we're also talking about multilateralism and the importance of small nations in the, in the UN. Yeah, well, I think the, the values and the priorities that we bring to the United Nations, um, there is a consistency to them, um, but they have, there's no redundancy in the priorities that we have always had and that we continue to develop. So that in areas like peacekeeping, peace building, disarmament, human rights, development, all of those um, will continue to be absolutely critical issues at the center of discourse in the United Nations. Um, and we're there and we are a tremendously adept and skilled and respected bridge builder in the United Nations. Because of course we are a modern developed nation, but we have the memories and the experience of our past, the rapport that creates with the developed world and so on. So we are, um, we are hugely in demand in the United Nations as a bridge builder. Um, and that is a role that we can continue to play. And we, you know, there are some new issues, um, I would say to Molly as well, that in the past, you know, when I was a young diplomat, we weren't talking about climate change and so on. These are relatively new issues for our diplomacy where we are developing um, very detailed positions. We have a rapport with the small island states and we're taking their concerns on board. So our traditional areas of priority continue to be absolutely in our center of our vision, but we, we take on new roles as well. But we are a much trusted, much relied on bridge builder in the United Nations. Okay, and that takes us uh, then into a question that again has popped up just as you mentioned it, which is a huge uh, question, maybe the biggest of all, uh, which is climate change. Um, the question is, do, do you think that the US rejoining the Paris Agreement will make a difference? Uh, I would link that, I think, back to the community of values uh, that constitutes the EU, and maybe you could actually lay out in more concrete detail what, uh, you know, what, how does that how does that translate into policy uh, what, uh, along the lines you suggested earlier? Well, I think that yes, um, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement is is tremendously important. Now there are a lot of people out there already, of course, able to point validly to some of the the flaws in the Paris Agreement. It doesn't do enough. It doesn't go far enough. And you know, it's it's signing up for language rather than solid implementation. And um, so, of course, it's not the perfect instrument, but it, it was as good an instrument as as could be achieved. And the psychological impact, um, as well as the, the practical, political, legal impact of having the US back on board uh, for the Paris Agreement is is tremendously um, important. Um, and the fact that President Biden 
said he was going to do it on day one and did it immediately, that he gave it that priority and that um, he has so unambiguously signaled that this will be a priority for administ his administration. That's tremendously important. But again, linking back to the, the earlier um, questions and you brought it up again about values and shared values. What I think is, is very important about this is seeing the US and the EU back together working on something that is a shared priority for both of them. Because again, I come back to those, you know, the shared bedrock values that there are between the EU um, and the United States um, and the necessity for us to, to work together. I mean, we, we built the institutions of the multilateral world. It was the Europe and the United States together. Um, and so we now, we, 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 ha we have big challenges to face, the, the obvious ones, you know, that we've talked about. Um, but also, how do we, um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we make our model work for the 21st century? I mean, you see the, the populism, obviously, that has taken hold here in the United States, that's also taking hold in Europe, um, which is fanned by certain personalities, but to a large degree, it is coming from the disillusionment with the economic model, the model of capitalism as it has um, been worked out in the United States and in Europe. Um, and the, the, the increasing skepticism about open international trade, the feeling that, you know, trade isn't bringing us benefit, it's robbing us of jobs. So how do we um, not just face specific challenges that we outline, but how do we make our model work for the 21st century? How do we deal with the domestic populism? How, those values and the, the interrogation of the values and the redefining of the values and the together trying to jettison some of the baggage that we may have accumulated and that has led to populism and so on. None of these big questions will be answered without Europe and the United States uh, cooperating. So I, it, it's, a, it's a huge question, but, but if I come back to the, the Paris Accord, at least it was an immediate signal. Yes, this is important in itself, and yes, it's important that we work with partners and particularly with Europe. Uh, uh, definitely, and, th and then in, in the course of describing that, you've, you, you've touched on like the, the root problem uh, uh, in, in our current political crisis. It's, it's a, you know, a political crisis in the West, a global political crisis. And it, you know, it has to do with inequality. Um, you mentioned Amartya Sen's argument on how contemporary capitalism uh, gets Adam Smith wrong. It leaves out the prudence, the humanity, the justice, the generosity, um, um, the public spirit. And to put it in your own, in your own words and, and your own non-euphemistic uh, words, uh, uh, how did we allow a deviant and dumbed down version of capitalism uh, to take such hold? Now, those words were delivered in 2008 in Paris in the middle of a, a previous crisis. So I guess the question is, you know, how are we doing today? Uh, because it, it seems that, it seems that the, there's a question of inequality underlying uh, so, so, so much of uh, uh, what's been happening. There's absolutely no question about that, Kevin. And, and I, I recognize the speech that you're referring to. Uh, and I remember the indignation as I was delivering it. It was, as you say, in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 crisis. And, and I was, Indeed, as you say, talking about this, this kind of cherry picking of Adam Smith that has gone on forever and the apotheosis of the individual effort and, and the, the, the invisible hand of the market and the total forgetting about the, you, you know, his concepts of universal benevolence and all of that was to be anchored uh, to some kind of social purpose. But beyond the details of Adam Smith, which are a bit arcane, I suppose, the sobering point about all of this is that I gave that speech in whenever it was 2008 or 2009 under the immediate influence of the 2008 uh, seismic crisis when the whole system seemed to be collapsing and there was a sense at the time that um, this seismic as I said crisis was going to change everything and the, the world as it emerged 
in the aftermath of the crisis was going to be substantially changed. And that we had now learned our lesson that, you know, greed is not good and, and, and everything was going to be rethought. And of course it wasn't. Um, and in the intervening years, you know, it all came back the way it was and the rich got richer and the middle class were winnowed out and inequality grew. And I suppose what I said about the, the sobering point about it all is here we are now in the midst of another seismic crisis um, at the time of pandemic. And we're all talking about building back better. And we're talking about, you know, the lessons we've learned about the role of government and the need for solidarity and the importance of community and the place of essential workers. Will we really build back better or will it just become a slogan? I mean, and it is very sobering, as I say, and we should remind ourselves that back in 2008, 2009, we thought then we were going to build back better and we didn't get it right and, and everything became worse. So I, I think it's not just, to, again, to speak to your earlier point about history and things repeating themselves. We need to learn from that history and, and look at exactly as you say, it is the yawning injustice and inequality in our society that is the, the breeding ground for so much of, of, of what we find dismaying. And yeah, and so one might put certain parallel political developments in, in um, the US and the UK in, in, in that context. Uh, the, if not Brexit, then the appeal of certain pro-Brexit arguments uh, would, would make a uh, certain degree of sense. And of course, that raises the big question and it comes from Brian Malone in Boston. Um, uh, are, are there grounds for optimism um, economically, socially, politically and figuring this out uh, for Ireland, for the UK and for the EU? Huge question, I know, but we'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on that. Um, it's hard for me to reach for optimism about Brexit. Mm. I mean, my, my personal view, of course it's personal, is that, you know, Brexit was it was wrong for Britain, wrong for Europe, wrong for Ireland. Um, I, I, it was based on illusions about the past and illusions about the future that Britain might create for itself going al it alone. That's obviously my, my personal op opinion as a committed European. Um, but I mean, clearly we can't just, it, it was the British right to choose, the right of the, the British people to exercise their choice democratically as they did. And of course, we all accept that. Um, and you don't just stand on the sidelines wringing your hand, your hands. I mean, we've got to make it work for our island. Um, we all know the, the, the ongoing difficulties with the um, Northern Ireland Protocol. We just have to make it work for our island. Um, in terms of what Ireland is doing, obviously, we're, as well as looking after the issues on our island, um, we are looking at Europe without Britain, and we are knowing that we have lost a partner in Britain on many of the, you know, when we were looking for an open Europe, a less protectionist Europe and so on. So we are busy developing, nurturing new relationships, closer relationships with countries like Denmark or the Netherlands, who share some of our philosophies on key um, EU issues. So certainly I think um, Ireland is, is well down the road in trying to navigate the UK-less Europe. Um, I think a lot of people in Europe see opportunities without Britain. Um, you know, for many in Europe, many people in Germany um, and France, for example, Britain was always a bit of a cuckoo in the nest. Uh, it was never fully at home in Europe. It acted as a break on certain developments in Europe towards a more social Europe and in some other ways. Um, and they see it as an opportunity now to, um, to make up for some of those deficits and to build Europe in a way um, that Britain impeded the other member states from building Europe um, over the decades of its membership. And there is something to be said for that. I mean, we'll obviously be vigilant and but there is a space to build a more social Europe and Ireland definitely would want to be part of that rather than a break on that. 
the opportunities for Britain outside Europe, well, I think I'll leave that to British diplomats to, um, <laughs> to sketch that out. <laughs> uh, two, two final uh, uh, questions uh, briefly. Um, one from uh, Paul Odour, who uh, thanks you for um, an intervention <laughs> uh, in his earlier career uh, and asks uh, later in chat, uh, is the public service ethic um, in Ireland, I think, uh, or generally increasing or diminishing? That's, that's one question, the public service ethic. Uh, my own exerting hosts uh, privilege uh, is you, you use a lovely uh, phrase in, in the book. Uh, let me pull it up. Um, the I think I have it in memory, but I better get it right. Um, the radicalizing effect of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if you would answer Paul's, Paul Odour's question. And, and I think I know what the radicalizing effects of retirement are uh, in your book, uh, but maybe you'll comment on both of those. Um, well, Paul, about the, um, and good to hear from you, the public service ethic. Um, I, I think it's hard to give you an absolutely objective scientific answer on that. Um, my hope is that it's increasing. Um, uh, I think new generation of young people in Ireland um, are idealistic, are committed, um, are in many ways seeing the futility of a career that brought a financial reward but little else besides. And I think in line with a wider movement towards a more value-based society, um, where you care about community and environment um, and social good and larger purpose, I think that has to fortify the instinct to public service and the ethic of public service. So um, I, I'm hoping that that's well-based. It's my genuine belief that that is the, the, the trend, um, and I hope so. Um, to your comment, Kevin, about, uh, yes, I did use that radicalizing effect. <laughs> um, I suppose it's a liberating effect. Um, uh, those who know me um, have always understood what I believe in, um, what I value, what I crusade for. Um, and I'm not suggesting that there was a big contradiction in my public life as a diplomat. I think I, it was my great good fortune that by and large, I could accommodate my own interests and ideals um, to what I was required to speak to and represent. And I, I think that is an immense good fortune and privilege. But even allowing for that, of course, um, when you, uh, I'm now three and a half years retired, I was particularly careful, I think, um, in the early part of that, in speaking about what was happening in the United States with the Trump administration and so on, because I wanted to kind of signal how I felt, but I certainly didn't want to create difficulties for my colleagues still at the cold base. Um, so now that I don't have to worry about that, I can be even more radicalized <laughs> in the period ahead. No, but seriously, I, um, I, and also when you look back over the, the sweep of the decades of the career, some, some patterns become obvious, thing, obvious to you. And certainly on, on gender issues, um, I think I have definitely become more outspoken, but on some other issues as well. And I'm definitely enjoying the freedom and the liberation uh, of uh, being retired. Well, it's been a wonderful conversation, Anne. Thank you so much. And I, I just wonder if we might close with if you wanted to, to offer us any um, final reflections on the culturally significant month of March or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, in closing, Kevin, because I see that we're already over our time, I want to thank you um, for your very stimulating and thought provoking questions and, and to thank everybody who joined in. Um, and of course, as we said at the beginning, this is beautifully positioned between International Women's Day and St. Patrick's Day. So my final um, thought is simply that we all have, despite the constraints of the time, that we all have a great St. Patrick's Day. And so um, let's all just be happy 
in, in, in our Irishness and here in Irish America, let's celebrate it and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to all. Thank you. <laughs>